good afternoon. I'll, I'll be briefing you virtually again today, and Brendan Varma will uh, then brief you from inside the briefing room. The informal meeting of the 5 plus 1 on the Cyprus issue got underway in Geneva a few hours ago. As you know, the Secretary General decided to organize this meeting past several months on his his behalf by Secretary General Jane Wolut. Not long ago, the Secretary General held a bilateral meeting with the Turkish Cypriot delegation and is about to start one with the Greek Cypriot delegation. This evening, the Secretary General will host a reception for the heads of delegations. On Wednesday morning, he will host a plenary meeting with the five parties and is then expected to hold bilateral meetings with each of the five delegations in the afternoon. Later that evening, Mr. Guterres will hold an informal dinner for the heads of delegations. More meetings are expected on Thursday, for which we will release details later. As we have repeatedly said, the purpose of the meeting will be to determine the common ground exists for the parties to negotiate a lasting solution to the Cyprus issue within a foreseeable horizon. The UN Special Envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffiths, concluded a two-day visit to Egypt on Monday. He met there with Egyptian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sameh Shukri, and the Secretary General of the Arab League, Ahmad Abuel Aged, as well as a number of representatives of Yemeni political parties, tribal sheikhs, women, civil society, and journalists. Mr. Griffiths also met virtually with the Yemeni Speaker of Parliament, Sultan Barakani. The Special Envoy briefed the Egyptian Foreign Minister and the Secretary General of the Arab League about ongoing efforts to reach a ceasefire in Yemen, alleviate the humanitarian situation, and revive an inclusive political process to resolve the conflict. In his meetings with representatives of Yemeni civil society, women, political parties, and journalists, Mr. Griffiths stressed the need for the attack on Marib to stop. He warned of the dire humanitarian consequences of the continued attack and the risks to the prospects of the peace process. Meanwhile, our humanitarian colleagues report that fierce fighting continues in Yemen's Marib governorate. Nearly 20,000 people have been displaced by violence in the region since early February, and dozens of civilians have been killed or injured. Humanitarian organizations are on the ground, responding to these growing humanitarian needs. Today, the UN started regular humanitarian air service flights to Marib. This will cut the journey down to two hours from seven and will help the humanitarian community to deliver quickly much-needed assistance. Over recent weeks, hostilities have also escalated in other parts of Yemen, causing devastating loss of life and hardship for Yemenis, many of whom are on the brink of starvation. We continue to call for a nationwide ceasefire. The UN and partners also urgently need more support to sustain the life-saving response in Marib and across Yemen. The 2021 Humanitarian Response Plan is currently 34% funded, with $1.32 billion received out of $3.85 billion required. Turning to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, a team of our colleagues working with the UN Environment Program and the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is in the country and in neighboring Barbados, to provide environmental assistance in support of both governments following La Soufrière's explosion, eruption. The volcano continues to erupt and remains at red alert level. The 14-person team, 12 of whom are in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, includes five environmental specialists with expertise in geology, ash management, environmental pollution, and green response. Air quality, ash management, and related water and soil contamination are among the main environmental concerns. Other challenges include sanitation and shelters, excessive use of plastics, as well as the large amount of waste generated by ongoing relief efforts. Food security and livelihoods have also been affected due to the impact of the eruption on agriculture, livestock, marine ecosystems, and ecotourism. We issued the following statement late yesterday. The Secretary General is deeply concerned about the recent armed clashes in Mogadishu. He reiterates his call for all Somali stakeholders to refrain from further violence and resolve their differences through dialogue and compromise. The Secretary General urges all Somali stakeholders to resume negotiations immediately and forge an agreement based on the 17th September electoral model and Bedoa proposals. At a Security Council open debate on the protection of civilians in armed conflict, Mark Lowcock, the Emergency Relief Coordinator, said there hasn't been enough progress in the compliance with international humanitarian law to protect civilians and the objects they rely on to survive. 
He pointed to three areas to strengthen the protection of civilians. First, he said, we need improvements in the identification of indispensable civilian objects, as well as, a com as compliance with no-strike lists that include them. Second, Mr. Lowcock renewed his plea to avoid the use of explosive weapons with wide area effects in populated areas. Finally, he said that ensuring accountability for serious violations of international humanitarian law is one of the greatest challenges we face in strengthening the protection of civilians. Unless there is accountability, he added, miscreants will draw the lesson that serious crime pays. Mr. Lowcock concluded by saying that what we need now is the political will from member states and all parties to armed conflict to respect the rules and do the right thing. The UN mission in the Central African Republic, MINUSCA, has carried out a, a, civili a civil military assessment mission in the Wuhan Pende Prefecture to document facts regarding multiple allegations of human rights violations. The joint mission was also an opportunity to raise awareness among the Central African Armed Forces, the internal security forces, and civil society about the nature of these human rights violations, as well as the mission's mandate. The mission also recently organized a workshop for members of their community violence reduction project in the city of Bangathu in the Mombumo Prefecture. The workshop focused on the implementation of income-generating activities, COVID-19 prevention, and also included a call for blood donations. This is part of the mission's activities to support the rehabilitation of public infrastructure to support Bangasu's development. The project will enable its 500 participants to get back into the workforce. I just want to flag that the office where the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has launched this year's Humanitarian Response Plan for Colombia. The plan requests $174 million to reach 1.4 million people. Humanitarian needs in the country increased last year as a result of the pandemic. Some 6.7 million people need humanitarian assistance, including 5.6 million who are in severe need. OCHA said that 3.5 million people are facing severe food insecurity, mostly as a result of the pandemic. Women and children continue to be the most affected, as well as ethnic minorities, such as indigenous communities in peripheral areas of the country. More information is available online. In India, our colleagues on the ground continue supporting authorities and communities to tackle the impacts of the pandemic. UN entities have been training health workers, including 10,000 nurses, through UN Women initiatives. Our UN team also partnered with employers and workers' organizations to promote jobs and entrepreneurship opportunities. 11 help desks and on-site counseling activities on COVID-19 prevention and business continuity were set up by the UN Development Program, the UN Industrial Development Organization, and the International Labor Organization. These have benefited over 140,000 employees. UNIDO also developed an online platform to help companies bounce back from the crisis, tailored to smaller businesses, while ILO helped over 100,000 self-employed workers to access social security measures and training on safety and health. We're also focusing on getting jobs for 10 million young people. Over 13,000 women and youth, including returning migrants, are being trained through entrepreneurship programs led by UN Women and ILO. And a web portal from the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific to boost e-commerce has benefited 950 women entrepreneurs in small and medium businesses. In Latin America and the Caribbean, Jamaica, Paraguay, and Ecuador have recently received their second batches of, of COVAX-backed vaccines. Yesterday, Jamaica received over 55,000 doses, while Paraguay got more than 130,000 doses, and Ecuador, 330,000. These are UN-backed efforts at the global, national, regional, and country levels, working closely with local health authorities to boost the national vaccination campaign, focusing on at-risk groups First, a quick note to flag that today, the Democratic Republic of the Congo has launched a yellow fever vaccination campaign targeting more than 16.3 million people. This is, this is the first such drive against the disease in Africa in 2021. The campaign, which was partly delayed because of COVID-19, is being carried out in seven of the country's 26 provinces. People aged nine months to 60 years are being targeted. The campaign also includes nearly 300,000 refugees. It's a collaborative effort involving the country's health authorities with the support of the World Health Organization and other partners. The vaccination campaign is part of a comprehensive strategy to eliminate yellow fever epidemics globally by 2026. And I'm delighted to welcome Mali to the list of fully paid up member states. It is the 94th nation to pay its regular budget dues in full. And with that, uh, I will... Um,
I, I will uh, turn to your questions before we hear from Brendan. Um, I see some hands up in the room. I'll go first to Edie. Uh, thank you very much, Farhan. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, Human Rights Watch today uh, is accusing Israel of committing crimes of apartheid and persecution against Arabs in the occupied territories and Israel itself. Does the Secretary General have any comment? Well, regarding human rights concerns uh, in, in Israel, uh, involving Israel and, and the occupied territories, we've been raising our own concerns about this. Uh, and, and as you know, whenever we see any signs of uh, policies uh, that are discriminatory in nature, uh, whether, uh, whether uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories or anywhere else, we, we draw attention to those and we try to make sure that those are addressed. Uh, bless you. Um, uh, regarding uh, regarding uh, 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 the report's uh, characterization, of course, I, I you know it's it's not for me uh, to analyze or characterize uh, uh, the situation uh, uh, in any particular way. I, I leave the, the analysis of the report over to you. But certainly, from from our standpoint, what we try to do is to work with authorities, including the authorities in Israel, to make sure that that uh, our human rights concerns are addressed. Second question. Um, today, um, a remotely piloted boat um, packed with explosives uh, exploded off the Saudi coast. It apparently was targeting the Saudi port of Yanbu. Um, does the Secretary General have any comment on this kind of attack? Uh, well, we would need uh, some further details about what has happened. Obviously, we want to make sure that uh, that there are no attacks on, uh, in, in particular, on uh, er areas such as ports that are used uh, f uh, in any significant uh, way for for the sort of commercial traffic that that people depend on. Uh, so, uh, so that is our point of principle. But uh, but uh, we'd have to see whether there are any additional details uh, concerning this this particular incident. Uh, Toby, you got your hand up? Thanks, Farhan. Uh, thank you for the briefing. My question is, do we have any more information on the uh, diplomatic efforts of Special Envoy uh, Christine Schroner-Bergner? We have some, some indications from the Junta in Myanmar that they are considering uh, recommendations from ASEAN, and this happens as uh, fighting is spilling over into into another country, into Thailand. So wh what is she doing? Can, and can we find out more about the meeting she had with the head of the top Uh No, I mean, uh, we were able to confirm that that meeting took place. And uh, as I made clear yesterday, she will continue to engage uh, with uh, all the different stakeholders in, in Myanmar, including uh, with the top uh, so she's going to continue with her work, uh, and and she did meet with a number of uh, different foreign ministers of ASEAN countries on the margins of the meeting of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and uh, she's going to continue with that engagement. But uh, at this point of the diplomatic process, we're not going to be able to give uh, a lot of details. We've, we've told you what the goals she's trying to achieve are, and those, those are unchanged. The, the I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the, the world really is looking to the UN right now for for this diplomacy as this situation gets worse and worse. So, you know, any further information that we can have is is really, uh, you know, very much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and as soon as we can uh, do that, we will certainly uh, try to provide those details. Uh, but uh, as, you, as you're aware, the nature of the diplomatic process is that sometimes uh, we uh, need to give... Um, our diplomats on the ground, the space uh, to conduct their work, um, and and uh, that is what we will be doing. Uh, Kristen Salumi, nice to see you again. Uh, you you have the floor. Hi Farhan, nice to see you as well. You mentioned uh, the unfortunate situation in Somalia. Wondering if the Secretary General has 
had the opportunity to talk to the president there and if there's any indication or concern that the violence might spill out of Mogadishu and spread? Anything more you can tell us? Well, the Secretary General has uh, uh, has uh, spoken uh, uh, with uh, President Farmaggio in in uh, recent weeks, as as I believe we we pointed out some some time ago, and uh, we've raised our concerns both uh, through him and through uh, uh, the UN office in Somalia, UNSOM, uh, which has been raising its own concerns about the situation. Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, those uh, the concerns about how we handle uh, the political situation on the ground uh, do not uh, in any way justify the sort of violence uh, that happened over the weekend and uh, and which uh, which we commented on in the statement uh, put out yesterday and maybe just a follow up on okay, uh, on Chad sure uh, since your yeah. remarks yesterday two protesters have been killed uh, the opposition does not seem satisfied with the offer of elections in 18 months. Uh, any updates you can give us on, on any reaction to that timeline for an election? Is that realistic? Um, anything more you can tell us? Well, what I can say is that the Secretary General is concerned about the reports of violence uh, uh, during the protests in Chad today. Uh, and he stresses the need to respect human rights and urges all stakeholders to refrain from violence. Uh, and uh, regarding the larger issue that you mentioned, uh, the Secretary General reiterates the United Nations support for dialogue with the aim of finding a consensual, inclusive, and peaceful return to civilian rule and constitutional order. Uh, and with that, uh, I, I, there was another hand in the back. I, uh, I can't quite see from the back of your head who it is, but, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yes, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, I, I have a question. It has been more um, uh, 100 days since Biden took the office. How do you evaluate the cooperation between the United States and the United Nations? Another question, the Biden administration has decided to restore funding to UNRWA. Any comment on this? Yes, well, uh, we've, we've made clear, uh, including um, uh, through our comments, uh, uh, when the decision was first taken, that we appreciate uh, the re return of the United States uh, to the funding of the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees. Uh, that is helpful at a time when uh, funding is crucially needed so that the agency can uh, conduct its work for Palestine refugees. Uh, it's not up to the U.S. alone, however, and we've made clear that we want uh, other nations also uh, to... Uh, step up their own funding for UNRWA so that it can go back uh, to the levels of fundings that, that it had previously enjoyed. And so uh, so that is what we are uh, uh, pushing for. But the moves uh, made by the United States have been welcome. And then regarding your larger question, uh, of course, uh, the, the UN, as, as a general rule, uh, tries to make sure that it, it will have a, a, a strong and healthy relationship uh, with the United States, given our uh, our common goals and interests, and uh, and uh, and we are uh, continuing to do that with the, the current administration of President Biden. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, we'll turn to uh, some of the callers online. Uh, first off, uh, uh, Ibtisam Azam. Uh, thanks, Farhan. I would like to go to the uh, issue uh, that Edith asked you about, about the Human Rights um, Watch report. Um, so you talked about uh, the fact that the UN uh, did also uh, document uh, and also document uh, uh, abuses wherever they happen, including in Israel and Palestine. But the report goes um, beyond just uh, documenting the regular uh, abuses. They talk about, uh, they came to the conclusion of uh, that these abuses are uh, policies of uh, uh, constitute the crimes of apartheid, persecutions, uh, crimes against humanity, uh, and uh, they have recommendations. Uh, uh, and some recommendations to the UN, and their recommendations to the UN include establishing a UN commission of inquiry to investigate systematic 
discrimination and uh, repression in Israel and Palestine, and also a UN global uh, envoy um, uh, to apartheid worldwide. So what's your comment on these specific recommendations? Well, we we will need to study the report and see uh, what uh, what needs to be done on our side uh, to follow up on the report. As as you know, it's just out. Uh, but uh, but regarding uh, uh, some of these uh, issues, such as the issue of crimes against humanity, uh, those sorts of allegations are are ones that need to be addressed by mandated uh, judicial bodies. And uh, of course, it's not up to us. To create, uh, we, uh, you know, as you're as you're aware, it's it's member states or groups of member states who, that can create those sorts of mandates. So, so that question is really one in terms of what uh, what the member state bodies of the UN would want to do, and and we'll have to see how they themselves wish to follow up on this. Okay, so I have a follow up on that, uh, especially that you're saying you will be studying uh, this report and their recommendations to the UN, etc. Does this mean that the SG office uh, going to request a, a briefing from Human Rights Watch on the reports uh, to hear how the team came fully to, to, to fully understand the picture and how the team came to the conclusions they came to? Well, uh, no. What happens with all of these reports? Uh, whenever we receive them, the the respective departments, uh, including those dealing with political affairs uh, and those uh, dealing with other issues, uh, those dealing with human rights, for example, uh, can can look over and see uh, what steps are needed on our side. So uh, we leave those evaluations to be taken by the respective departments. I, I wouldn't predict. Uh, what form that follow-up would take? Yeah, but uh, but leaving this, what, what do you mean? Do you mean like uh, different departments at the UN, or it's it's like it seems to be that you are leaving this out there uh, without taking any action, which will lead somehow also nowhere. Well, no. I, any, anytime, anytime there is a significant report to look at, uh, what happens is we let. Uh, the, the key people in our various offices, whether it's political affairs, humanitarian affairs, or others, uh, look at that and 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 see what to do uh, with uh, with the, the recommendations. And so, so that is, you know, that's ultimately what we will do with this report as well. And so, that process of studying and evaluating the report is, has just begun. Uh, okay. Uh, Okay, but I have just a, a follow-up. Would it be then possible to get um, uh, a follow-up for us as journalists about uh, your standing on the report, or I assume we will have to ask you again? Well, we'll 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 have to see it as this proceeds. I mean, it's it's not it's simply not the case that uh, we take an uh, immediate reaction uh, to something that needs to be studied. Uh, and so that study process takes a bit of time, and we'll allow them to, to do that. Uh, okay, uh, Yoshita Singh. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, on the uh, COVID situation in India, where we're seeing the cases rise and also the death toll, uh, has the Secretary General and other UN leaders been in touch with the authorities in India? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, is the UN and its agencies on the ground sort of ramping up support, whether it's with critical uh, medical infrastructure, uh, you know, related to with vaccines, PPE, and other sort of uh, infrastructure required right now to uh, to uh, help uh, uh, the authorities there in uh, providing assistance to the uh, people? Thank you. Well, yes, we've been in touch at various levels. Uh, I know that our chef de cabinet uh, was recently in touch with the permanent representative of India here. And uh, and other officials in the system have also been in touch with officials both here in New York and and on the ground. Uh, one of the things we uh, did is we offered uh, the assistance of our integrated supply chain if it was required. Uh, we've been we've been told at this point uh, that it's not needed uh, because India has uh, uh, reasonably robust systems to deal with this. But uh, but our offer stands and we're willing to uh, help in whatever way we can. Uh, another one of the things we've tried to do, by the way, is make sure that our our own uh, staff, whether international or national in India, 
are um, are taken care of so that they don't place a burden on the healthcare systems in India. And and uh, luckily, we've maintained a very uh, low level of of cases. So uh, so we've uh, I think been succeeding at at trying to do that and making sure that uh, that we're not pressuring uh, a healthcare system that already uh, is facing uh, extreme challenges. So, um, uh, can we expect any shipments of uh, of uh, you know uh, uh, re related material or uh, important material to reach from UN agencies or? Uh... Well, n none have been sought so far. But like I said, w you know, we do have people, including uh, our 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 um, uh, people who deal with operational and logistical issues, who are willing to help uh, if we're needed, and we're in touch with our counterparts in India to see whether that will be useful. Um, James Rhino. Thank you, Farhan. I've got two questions. First one on Yemen, second one on COVID. Um, on Yemen, you, uh, you mentioned before the <clears throat> launch today of UN flights and air bridge to Marib. Um, if you've got any more details about that, they'd be really appreciated. Is it a daily flight? What kind of supplies are you getting into Marib? And is, has this been uh, uh, opened in coordination with both authorities, the Houthis and the government of Yemen? Well, regarding that, uh, of course, in order for the humanitarian air service to work, uh, it needs clearance from all the respective authorities on the ground. So we've been in touch with the various, you know, de facto authorities to make sure that this can go. Uh, we're we're just starting it up, and we'll probably get more details as as the humanitarian flights proceed. Uh, what was what's your next question? Yeah, yeah, it's the second question on COVID in India. Obviously, you were just talking to Yoshita about the um, uh, the work that the UN is doing uh, in India. Um, but, but I'm wondering, this uh, major resurgence of the pathogen in India, does that tell us anything as the international community about the wisdom of whether or not we should host major political rallies or let big religious festivals go ahead during a pandemic? Well, I think I'll, I'll leave it to our colleagues at the World Health Organization to uh, to give a more formal evaluation about this. We've been warning about the sort of precautions that need to be taken in every country. And, and certainly, uh, uh, we want to make sure that all of the various precautions that have been recommended by the World Health Organization are followed through by, by every country. Uh, at this stage, one of the other lessons, though, is we have to uh, be clear that until the COVID-19 pandemic is uh, is essentially confronted and defeated in every country. Uh, it won't it won't uh, be solved for any country. Um, that is to say that although there are different places that are thankfully making progress with measures including vaccinations or or uh, local quarantines or other different precautions. Uh, we we have to remain vigilant, and as the Secretary General has made clear, we have to cooperate, and, and nations have to cooperate with each other to make sure that uh, COVID-19 can be defeated in every nation, because uh, you can always get uh, areas, uh, uh, different countries, or or different uh, variant strains that, uh, that can, again, uh, cause a huge problem, uh, not just not just for one nation, but but for, for, for regions and ultimately for the world. Thank you, Farhan. Thanks. Uh, Abdul Hamid. Uh, thank you, Farhan. I have a couple of questions. First, I have a follow-up to the Sam question. Uh, do you recall that the, it was the UN first to declare that it's Israel has an apartheid system vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians? When they put, uh, when ESCO put a report in 2017, yet the Secretary General ordered Dreema Khalab, the Executive Secretary of the time, to take that report down. Is it time for the UN to revisit its own report on the system Israel is applying to the Palestinians? Well, again, uh, without characterizing uh, it uh, one way or another, we have been getting the various facts out about the situation on the ground, including in the report, by the way, that you mentioned, which I believe the facts of the report were 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 released, uh, and and we'll continue to do that. Uh, ultimately, it's important to have a solid base of information about what's happening, and that's what we try to provide. Okay, my second question: uh, On the twenty-first of April, the Israeli occupation of 
is arrested journalist Ala A L A A Arimawi from his home in Ramallah. He is number now 26 Palestinian journalists arrested by Israel. A committee to protect journalists issued a statement calling for his release. He went on to a hunger strike now. The UN is silent about those, his arrest and the other journalists. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, uh, what, what I have to say is that it, it is our principle that all journalists in every country, including here, need to be protected uh, so that they can go about their work without, uh, without harassment and, uh, and, uh, uh, and without uh, the sort of uh, pressure uh, uh, that we've seen. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's important that uh, all journalists, uh, 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 including those uh, Palestinian journalists working uh, in uh, Israel and the occupied Palestinian ter territories, be, uh, be uh, accorded their basic rights. My my last question, uh, Farhan, is about uh, the, the Kashmir region uh, in India. We know the uh, numbers of COVID uh, cases in India in general, but we don't have independent reports how the COVID-19 uh, pandemic spreading in the uh, region of Kashmir. Do you, uh, do you and have any independent source to tell us more about the situation in Kashmir? Uh, ultimately, the sources we have in, um, of information in all the various uh, uh, countries is is the information that we get from the national government. So I wouldn't be able to offer any further insight uh, about how um, uh, how uh, the cases break down by region. Uh, and uh, if the car over to you. Uh, thank you, Farhan. I had a follow up on the Human Rights Watch report, but Ibtisam and Abdul Hamid have already asked. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you. And uh, if there are no further questions, then I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Brendan Verma. Uh, I see none. So, Brendan, over to you. Farhan, I'm really sorry. Can I just oh. ask you one quick thing? Sure. A really quick follow up. Uh, you mentioned the air bridge to Marib. You didn't say where the flights are coming from. I'm assuming it's Sanar. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to check. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Thanks.